Hi, welcome to mini lesson 18. Today we're going to talk about the phenomenon of Bose-Einstein con condensation and how it was eventually observed uh, in about the mid-90s. So we're starting Schroeder's section 7.6 and there's another paper that I'll probably post on the Moodle page that's by Anderson et al. Um, it was really the first discovery paper about Bose-Einstein condensation in an experimental uh, observation. This is a really interesting topic because it's it's really very modern, the experimental work on it, uh, and it really impacted me when I was growing up because this kind of uh, the discoveries were happening right around the time I was graduating high school and deciding what I wanted to do with my life, and so I'll try to I'll try to point out to you not because I necessarily think you care about you know my glory days, but uh, because it's actually sort of an interesting science point. Um, some of the things that I was thinking about at that time uh, in comparison to what is actually true. So let's just remind ourselves of the basic idea of Bose-Einstein condensation, which we've kind of already seen when we looked at the Bose-Einstein occupation function a few lessons ago. So this is the Bose-Einstein occupation function, and the thing that we just noticed by plotting it for fixed values of beta or inverse temperature and chemical potential is that as you go to lower and lower temperatures, the occupation shifts more and more to lower energies. And so the red curve is the highest temperature, the green curve is an intermediate temperature, and the blue curve is a very low temperature. I forget what the exact values are, uh, doesn't really matter. So high temperature, we have a lot of occupation out at high energies, 8 to 90 V, right? There's more than one particle per level, even out here. Um, as we lower to the green curve, right, we have really not very much occupation in that energy range. And if you go above nine electron volts, you're pretty much at no occupation, zero occupation, right? So all the particles are down here at low energy. And then on the blue curve, when we've gone to really low energy, just because of the way I you know, chose to plot this, you almost can't see any occupation at all because it's all been pushed close to this divergence at energy equals the chemical potential, the dashed line, right? So basically all the particles are in this lowest energy state and none are at any of the other energies, right? And so this observation of a divergence should always start making you think, okay, there's gonna be a phase transition, right? You don't have real physical divergences in nature when something sort of looks like it's diverging, either theoretically uh, or in some measurement, it probably means a phase transition is happening, right? And so we might think that as you lower the temperature in an ideal Bose gas, you would reach a point where this divergence would sort of take over and dominate the behavior and there would be a phase transition. And so the question is, can we lower the temperature enough that all these atoms fall into the ground state and we find a new phase of matter? And the really interesting point is, we've got a mechanism in mind of having this condensation occur even though there are no interactions between the atoms and the gas, right? We have started with an ideal gas where they atoms only have kinetic energy. They don't see each other at all in terms of a, an interaction potential, right? And yet still we're claiming that there can be a condensation into a, a condensed phase, right? And so this is somehow a quantum condensation that's the result of particle statistics, namely Bose-Einstein statistics, and not the result of interparticle interactions. So the theoretical prediction uh, of a Bose-Einstein condensation effect was actually made in 1924 uh, by Bose and Einstein. And it took a much, much longer time to actually observe it because of this simple question, right? Can we actually start with an ideal gas and get it to low enough a temperature that it undergoes this quantum condensation and it's not allowed to undergo a normal condensation, right? You take a normal gas and you start cooling it down, it's gonna condense normally, right? Because it's, it's just gonna liquefy. And that's not what you want. You need to maintain it as a gas, 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 gas. And then all of a sudden, Bose-Einstein condensed. 
<clears throat> it's very unusual and experimentally challenging to realize that kind of condition. So, 1924, the prediction was made that it's possible and was not observed until 1995. And so this is, this is the paper in 1995 uh, by Anderson and others. So the, the principal investigators in the lab, the PIs were Wyman and Cornell. This was a, a, a Colorado group uh, at the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics um, in Boulder, pretty sure. Anyway, so 1995, this paper comes out. So the first two uh, citations by Bose and Einstein are showing you the theory in 1924 and 25. Um, and then I want you to note this third citation here where they're actually defining the thermal de Broglie wavelength, h over 2 pi m kbt square root. Um, <clears throat> so I actually, when I was, I graduated high school and I went to uh, my summer job that summer was to babysit my baby cousins in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, and when this paper came out, I read about it in the newspaper, and I walked to the library in the hot, hot July summer in Wilmington. Uh, I was super sweaty, and I got the paper, and I stood all covered in sweat to make photocopies at the library. And I read it, and I had known a little bit about quantum mechanics, and I knew what a de Broglie wavelength was, H over P, right? Uh, and then I looked at this footnote, and I was like, what, like I could think of a way to get this formula from H over P, except I couldn't figure out where that pi came from. And it drove me crazy. And somehow I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's like a typo or something. Like they could make a typo. But we know in PY 413 why there's a pi in the thermal de Broglie wavelength. And it's because the thermal de Broglie wavelength is not a de Broglie wavelength. You would never calculate it by simply taking h and dividing it by some p. It comes from doing statistics and it comes from doing statistics in a high dimensional phase space. And so that pi actually comes from the place where we calculated uh, the volume of a high dimensional hypersphere in our ideal gas calculation. And of course, I wasn't equipped to know that, uh, you know, when I was 17 years old, first starting college. <clears throat> yeah, so really important paper. Um, so how do they do it? And so the issue is you need to be able to make really cold but really dilute gases that are not allowed to condense normally but can achieve a Bose-Einstein condensation condition. And so the experimental techniques that needed to be developed for this to happen are the techniques of um, atom trapping uh, and laser cooling, right? And so the basic idea is a true BEC needs you to have an ideal gas, right? So if you take something like superfluid helium-4, we think there's a connect, sort of a connection between helium-4 superfluidity and Bose-Einstein condensation, but it can't be a true BEC because you're starting from a liquid and there's a potential energy of interaction between the atoms in a liquid. And so the the, the true, the pure BEC is not going to be achieved in helium-4. And so if you try to make it work, you get sort of transition temperatures that are, they're close. They're sort of order of magnitude close, but they're not right. <clears throat> and so there was really a thought, I think, you know, from the beginning that maybe it's just not possible. Like maybe this Bose-Einstein condensation effect is, you know, theoretically possible, but if you actually take a gas and try to do it, you'll just never be able to, right? You'll always either end up just liquefying the gas or solidifying the liquid, whatever, right? Some, some boring condensation. So, uh, but in the 80s and 90s, people really started to figure out how to take a really dilute gas and use lasers and electromagnetic fields as traps to cool down super duper dilute gases to very, very low temperatures. Um, so these were big experimental advances in the 80s and 90s, so that by the mid 90s, people had really realized, okay, if we take a gas of bosons and really push these techniques hard, we can probably achieve BEC. <clears throat> 
And so that's what Anderson et al. did. They basically took rubidium-87. I guess I should have written that on the slide, but rubidium-87, you should be able to explain to me why that is a bosonic atom. And they put the rubidium in an oven. It's actually probably not rubidium metal. It's probably what's called a rubidium getter. Um, rubidium metal is super reactive, and you don't want to work with it ever. But getters you can work with. Um, anyway, so heat it up, and the rubidium atoms come off the getter and fly through a vacuum tube. Uh, because it's a vacuum tube, they go in a beam. There's nothing for them to scatter off of. And they'll come into an experimental chamber, and in the experimental chamber, they use a combination of lasers, those are the red lines, <clears throat> and some sort of radio frequency electromagnetic fields to trap the atoms in this little region. Right? And I'm not giving you the full story of how they actually do this cooling. It's quite sophisticated. You know, it took many, many decades from the prediction of Bose-Einstein condensation to really develop the tools to make this happen. So it's really not easy, but it is something that people know how to do. <clears throat> and then they use another laser to image the gas. And so this is kind of what you see here. Uh, essentially, you sort of see the, the formation of a condensate uh, by looking at this high density region uh, in the gas, right? And so essentially by looking at the spatial distribution inside the trap, it tells you the velocity distribution. And so what you see with this blue, which means high density region, uh, is that at cold enough temperatures, uh, all of the atoms are falling into a state with the same velocity, and that corresponds, okay, now to the same quantized energy level. <clears throat> in other words, these are all ground state atoms in blue. Well, let's just do a quick calculation uh, of kind of what's involved in this um, what's involved in this analysis of what conditions do you need to achieve to get a Bose-Einstein condensate. So the 1995 paper gives uh, the following parameters for the condensate. So they claim they've cooled the atoms down to a temperature of 170 nanokelvin, so it's quite cold. The density of atoms in the trap is about 2.5 times 10 to the 12th per cubic centimeter. And so in cubic meters, 2.5 times 10 to the 18th. And so let's just do some calculations here, right? And so when we're given the density of an ideal gas, we immediately have a measure of the average interparticle spacing. So by the way, this is a good kind of calculation review for the final. Um, <clears throat> I'm, assuming, I'm assuming that this analysis is something that you're very comfortable with. So the average interparticle spacing is just the cube root of one, uh, of one over the, uh, the number density. And so for this conditions here, it turns out to be 7.36 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, the, the average spacing between rubidium 87 atoms in the gas cloud. So the thermal de Broglie wavelength at a temperature of 170 nanokelvin, just plug the temperature in here, you need to use the mass of rubidium 87. So that's 87 times, basically it's 87 atomic mass units. Um, and you end up with a thermal de Broglie wavelength of 4.53 times 10 to the minus seven meters, <clears throat> right? And so the thermal de Broglie wavelength allows us to define quantum concentration N sub Q. So this is a parameter that appears in the soccer tetrode expression for entropy of an ideal monatomic gas. And that's just one over the thermal de Broglie wavelength cubed. And so you get 1.0 times 10, basically 1.1 times 10 to the 19th cu per cubic meter as a quantum concentration. And so if we say, according to the paper, that the condensation starts at this density, we actually see that the condensation, it, to me, it sort of seems to start when the density of atoms is just a little bit below the quantum concentration of the gas at this temperature, right? Uh, and so the basic idea is that um, the quantum nature is just barely starting to pick up when this number is about equal to this number. 
and it seems to start a little bit before. And I think we'll be able to see why in the next mini lesson when we actually sit down and do the theory of the Bose-Einstein condensate. So what we've done in this mini lesson is just talk about experimental evidence and sort of physical intuition for what's going on. Um, and I hope I hope in the in the next lesson it'll be clear why it might start a little bit before. And the basic point is, at these conditions you start to have a condensate, but it's not all condensate. Right? So there's actually probably some atoms that are still just thermally distributed according to the Bose distribution. All right, so we'll see you in the next lesson where we do a fairly difficult theory calculation about how to describe the actual phase transition that occurs in detail. We'll see you then.